go through the hip and groin pain in the athlete. Um, we've given this lecture every year, so some of you have heard this before, some of you have not, but we'll just kind of get rolling. So quick overview. Um, basically, we're going to talk about some of the uh, epidemiology of hip pain in athletes, uh, anatomy of the hip, differential diagnosis of hip pain, some important history and physical exam uh, maneuvers to focus on conditions and injuries, treatments, and um, we can talk about total hip replacement, uh, but we'll save that for another lecture. Hi. So, hi, good morning. I'm giving the lecture right now. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> um, and then we'll wrap it up. So, with that being said, uh, hip pain in the athletes, uh, about 2 to 5% of all sports-related injuries happen in the hip. 10% of injuries in professional hockey players, 5% of injuries in soccer players. And remember that three times the body weight is felt through the hip joint with walking and eight times the body weight is felt through the hip joint with jogging. And the body center of gravity is anterior to the S2 segment in the sacrum. So quick overview of the uh, natural hip joint. Uh, it's really a hip, uh, the ball and socket joint. The S tabula makes up the socket, the femoral head makes up the ball. Overall synovial fluid, just like any other joint, is made up of type A and B cells. Um, lubricant, uh, uh, joint lubrication follows an elasto-hydrodynamic lubrication principle. Don't necessarily need to know that. It's just a fancy, sciencey word uh, for Jeopardy questions. And then articular cartilage is type 2 cartilage. And the coefficient of friction, just like any other joint, really is 0.05 to 0 0.001. Um, and that's uh, what we're shooting for with uh, joint replacements as well. Uh, so the anatomy and physiology of the hip, uh, the sacrum and two innominate bones uh, form in the pelvis during, uh, you know, development. As we grow towards our teen years, they form the ilium, ischium, and pubis. Uh, they all form into making the pelvis. The secondary uh, uh, ossification centers form the proximal femur, are generally fused by late teenage years, and the ischial tuberosity and ASIS fuse as late as the third decade of life. So anatomy and physiology, the femoral antiversion decreases to an average of 10 to 15 degrees as you become an adult. Uh, the femoral neck shaft angle is about 130 to 135 degrees. And the predominant blood supply uh, to the femoral head is through the lateral ascending retinacular branches from the medial femoral circumflex. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a test question. Uh, so ligaments of the pelvis, remember these ligaments around the hip and the pelvis are some of the strongest in the body. Uh, the acetabulum, acetabular labrum is a type of ligament, a structure, it kind of lassos around the hip, forms this seal or gasket around the femoral head. Uh, the anterior iliofemoral ligament, also known as the inverted Y uh, ligament of Bigelow. The ischiofemoral ligament, the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments are in the posterior aspect of the pelvis, and the SI interosseous ligaments are also in the posterior aspects as well. So we have these strong anterior ligaments around the hip, and these very strong ligaments around the posterior pelvis and sacrum. <clears throat> Overall, the hip is actually designed as a, at a disadvantage mechanically. Uh, the femoral head is a really short lever arm, and thus we need to have these strong buttock muscles to generate large amounts of forces to move our hip. Uh, remember, we have these large uh, gluteal muscles. There are three of them, the gluteus maximus, minimus, and medius. Um, and then we have the, uh, uh, the anterior structures as well, which really focuses on the abdominal core as well as the erector muscles around the spine. And then don't, don't forget we have the you know, other thigh musculature like the uh, uh, direct head of the rectus, indirect head of the rectus, uh, the quad muscles, and the sartorius, and so on. <clears throat> so uh, when someone comes in presenting a hip pain, you want to ask them kind of where does it hurt, how long did it hurt, kind of get that sense for, you know, the timing and so on. So acute onset differential diagnosis. So someone comes in and says, hey, I was playing hockey yesterday and I felt something pop snap and I, you know, have a lot of pain. Those acute onset type injuries are typically muscular strains, contusions, such as like a hip pointer, uh, basically like someone just got thighed, you know, knee in the thigh or something like that. Dislocations or subluxations, acetabular labral tears on loose bodies and proximal femoral fractures. Obviously, the last one's going to be more, uh, is going to be less common, uh, and muscle strains and contusions are going to be more common. Insidious onset, so someone basically is like, yeah, I play a lot of sports, or I do a lot of things act actively, and I just had kind of the slow worsening pain uh, localizing to the groin or something like that. <clears throat> 
that's going to be more of that insidious onset. Um, so that includes sports hernias or athletic pubalgia, osteitis pubis, bursitis, snapping hip syndrome, stress syndrome, and osteoarthritis. Uh, other disorders that can mimic groin pain or hip pain, oftentimes I see this in my clinic uh, where patients come in and say, hey, my hip hurts. But what they're really describing is lumbar spine pathology. Uh, if you ask patients to point where they feel the pain, if they're pointing to their buttock, that typically rep represents a nervous system issue, like a peripheral nerve issue. Um, or if they're pointing to the groin, that typically represents a joint problem. So that's why when they come into my clinic, I say point with one finger where it hurts the most. Sometimes people can have pain in the hip that radiates to the side or down the leg. Sometimes people can have pain in the buttock that radiates down the leg. So there are some similarities and overlap, but that's something that's important to identify because people can have both hip and spine pathology happening at the same time. And our job is to elicit what bothers them the most. Uh, compressive neuropathies like we were just talking about. Someone who has like an irritated L5 nerve root, that'll cause irritation to the uh, uh, gluteal musculature and sometimes over the greater trochanter. Um, because remember the uh, glute um, maximus, medius, and minimus, uh, they're all innervated by the uh, superior gluteal nerve, which is a direct uh, distribution off the L5 nerve root, off the lumbar plexus. Uh, and so that's important to kind of keep in mind. Tumor pathology, obviously that's going to be uh, less common. That's going to be the zebra in the mix. Um, but you always, when you hear horses running, uh, once in a while, you might see a zebra, so you have to be careful about that, not miss those kind of tumors or diagnoses. Pediatric-specific disorders, that's a totally different conversation. But if you have someone who's, you know, under the age of a high schooler, uh, you have to be careful that they could have some growth plate issues or so on. So history and physical constitutional symptoms, again, you basically have to ask them, how long does it hurt you? Um, you know, describe the kind of pain you're having. Uh, you know, duration, timing of pain, location, again, having them point with one finger where they hurt the most. You know, as surgeons, we can really, like we treat pinpoint problems. When someone comes in and says, I hurt all over, that's not something I can help them with. So they have to be like, I hurt right here. And that's where I can help them. But if someone comes in and says, I have total body dolor, like diffuse body pain, uh, that's not something I'm going to help them with. Uh, past medical history, specifically <clears throat> rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, those kind of things can help you differentiate uh, potentially what's going on. Uh, a thorough neurovascular exam with muscular testing is going to be important as well. And then some specialty tests, which we'll get into here shortly. Um, so most injuries, um, most injuries involve soft tissue muscle strains that will allow full recovery. So that's a good thing. So most commonly, these are going to be kind of uh, muscular uh, related issues. They will heal up with a period of rest, ice, you know, compression, elevation, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy. But it's important not to, not to miss the emergent urgent entities or diagnoses such as like a septic hip, hip excuse me. Uh, skiffies or subcapital femoral epiphyseal syndromes, basically where the uh, femoral head slips off the femoral neck. That's in a pediatric patient population. So pretty unlikely you'd see that in the adult, uh, basically won't see that in the adult, in the adult population. But anytime you're seeing a high school age or junior high age kid, you have to keep that in mind with x-rays and so on. Compartment syndrome, obviously very rare, but we do see it from time to time, specifically in a more traumatic event. Um, you can have isolated thigh uh, compartment syndrome or gluteal compartment syndrome. Again, very unlikely, but it is important to keep it in your differential. Uh, tumors, obviously, always kind of keep that in the back of your mind. But again, thank goodness, very unlikely. Tension sided stress fractures, specifically if you see someone who's increased their running activity or if you have a female high school endurance runner who may not be having their menstrual cycles very regularly, they are at high risk for uh, stress fractures. So anterior hip pain, again, this is kind of your algorithm to work through uh, when you interview a patient. Uh, basically, how long does it hurt you? Uh, what kind of pain are you having? Is it clicking, snapping? Uh, a Thomas test, we'll get into that, but basically you're eliciting a iliopsoas bursitis uh, versus a labral tear with an impingement test. Uh, overuse type injuries, again, you could always get an MRI if you think they have a stress fracture. Um, and then you can, again, also have those hip flexor muscle strains and tendonitis. Again, MRIs are going to be helpful in basically all of these workups. 
but don't forget our first line of imaging is always x-rays okay so you always get x-rays and then depending on your differential diagnosis you're going to then move on to some kind of advanced imaging like an mri uh, the role of arthrograms are less common these days you don't necessarily have to get those as much so again, this is a Thomas test. You're going to hyperflex, abduct, and extend. You're going to put your finger over the ASIS, kind of that groin area. And you're, if you feel something snap in the front of the hip, that represents an iliopsoas bursitis or a snapping iliopsoas tendon. Um, that's different than the uh, impingement test, which is flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. If they feel that nutcracker effect, then that's more of a labral tear. So those are two opposite tests elicit eliciting anterior groin pain. So again, you're basically going to hyperflex uh, that hip. <clears throat> so again, more of an insidious onset. We see this in more of kind of the older patient population, greater trochanteric bursitis. Um, you can also uh, appreciate if someone has more of a gluteus medius or minimus dysfunction, uh, specifically if they, if they have a Trendelenburg test, a positive Trendelenburg test or Trendelenburg gait. That's basically where the ipsilateral pelvis will drop because the abductors are not strong enough to hold the pelvis level during single weight-bearing stance. And so that could represent some kind of irritated lumbar spine or a torn, <clears throat> a torn abductor like a gluteus medius or minimus tear. Those things typically do get better with physical therapy, and it's actually pretty rare that you have to operate on them. <clears throat> so always start with physical therapy. Again, an OBERS test, you're looking for IT band syndrome. These are the runners. Specifically, if they run and their feet cross over midline as they run, they're basically putting their IT band on additional stretch, um, and that's going to cause a lot of greater trochanteric pain. And so you can ch uh, check that with the OBERS test. That's basically where you put them on their side, um, and then you basically extend and adduct their hip. And if, they ha if they're tight and their knee does not touch the table or – if they're uh, developing a lot of greater trochanteric pain, that can be a positive overs test, and that can indicate IT band syndrome. Again, the good news is with all of these tests, really, physical therapy is the mainstay of initial treatment. So that's why physical therapists are so useful in these patient uh, demographics. <clears throat> Poster hip pain, again, a favors test. You're really looking for those posterior structures. Keep in mind the SI joint is really a non-mobile joint in the grand scheme of things, but it does have some micro motion that can occur to allow for accommodation uh, and joint absorption or force absorption, I should say. So just like any joint, the SI joint can get irritated, but it's not mobile like a hip joint or a shoulder joint or something like that. But the way you can check for that is with a Faber's test. That's basically um, where you flex them. You flex the hip. Faber stands for flexion, abduction, external rotation. And if that causes pain in the posterior aspect of the hip, that's a positive favors test. That represents SI joint irritation. <clears throat> so important to move on. So now that we've kind of evaluated our patient, we've taken a history, we've done a physical exam, the next step is x-rays, okay? So again, x-rays are our first line of imaging modalities that we obtain. So it's important to understand what you're looking at when you see an x-ray. Obviously, you're looking at the pelvis, you're looking at the hip joint, you're looking at the femur, you're looking at bone itself. Is there anything abnormal on the bony x-ray that makes you concerned? They have some kind of in, um, nefarious uh, diagnosis like cancer. Um, but really, again, those things are not going to be that common. But what you want to look at are kind of the structures around the hip. And we have these six lines that we look at to, um, uh, to better evaluate the hip joint itself. I usually ask questions at this point, but I can't see anyone, so we'll just kind of run through them. Uh, number one is the uh, posterior wall. Number two is the anterior wall. Number three is the sore seal, so kind of that, that kind of weight-bearing zone of the acetabulum. Uh, number four is the ileoischial line. That's also defined as Kohler's line. Um, I'm sorry, correction, that's five. So five is Kohler's line. That's kind of the medial aspect of the hip joint. Uh, number four is the teardrop. I'm sorry, that's that's an important structure as well when we're looking at the teardrop. That's a, another uh, indication for hip surgeons to, you know, identify any additional pathology. Do they have a medial osteophyte or something abnormal with the hip? Number four, number six is the iliopectineal line, and that's going to be all those six lines are going to be helpful for us to identify fractures, uh, bony injuries, uh, apophyseal issues. Those are going to be the, the structures we look at initially when we're looking at a hip joint x-ray. Uh, 
<clears throat> again, when you're looking at the pediatric population, we have some additional lines because pediatric patients, they are not fused yet. Their bones are not fused. And so oftentimes you have to get comparison x-rays looking at kind of what their other non-injured side looks like to see if there's anything abnormal because they're so cartilage-based at this age group that sometimes you can't see all the structures on x-ray. But you can look for lines and differentials on the, on the anatomy based off kind of where things should be. Uh, and we do that based on Perkins line, Hilgen Reiner's line, Shenton's line. All those things are going to be important for us to identify if someone has hip dysplasia, if their hip is kind of forced up and out. Um, that's going to be indicated based off their acetabular angle and disruption of Shenton's line. Those kind of things are going to be somewhat indicating that they probably have some underlying developmental dysplasia of their hip. <clears throat> so again, moving back to acute onset, muscle strains most often occur in muscle groups that cross two joints during eccentric contraction. Remember, your eccentric contraction is basically where your muscle is contracting while the joint is elongating, and that's going to cause uh, a lot of, or that one, that causes a lot of muscle growth if done correctly, uh, but also can lead to muscle strains if, if you do uh, an, an exercise uh, slop, uh, you know, sloppy or, you know, just kind of not thinking while playing sports. Uh, it usually occurs at the mile tendinous junction or the muscle belly. Good news is a lot of these will just heal on their own. And you have to be careful because um, during the developmental phase of children, it can lead to a po apophyseal avulsion type injuries, like where the SIS pops off during a sartorial contraction or something like that. That can lead to a lot of anterior pain in a pediatric patient. Good news is usually heals up. Uh, prevention with balancing antagonistic type muscles with stretching and warm up. Adductor strains are common early in sports season. So typically early in the season, someone's pulled their groin. Uh, that happens pretty commonly. Again, you know, physical therapy, rest ice, uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, those things are going to be helpful. May see some swelling and even a palpable defect on physical exam. That's all those things that kind of indicate that they probably have an acute onset muscle type strain. Again, always get a plain film, those basic x-rays that we get uh, to better understand what's going on. Oftentimes, x-rays can be diagnostic alone, um, but if they aren't, that's when we start to, um, basically, if the history is not matching up with your differential and the x-rays aren't showing you any additional information, that's typically when we get an MRI. <clears throat> Greater than 50% cross-sectional area involvement with fluid collections and deep muscle tears are associated with longer recovery times. So, if you get an MRI and you see that, you can tell a patient it's going to take much longer to heal. could take up to a year sometimes, depending on where the injury is and what their athletic goals are. So they keep that in mind. Iliopsoas strain, uh, resisted hip flexion. Soccer players get this basically when they kick a soccer ball. Rectus femoris strain typically will develop swelling 8 to 10 centimeters below the ASIS anteriorly. And typically, again, this happens with sprinting or kicking. So soccer players can get this a lot. So again, based on this uh, x-ray, or sorry, correction, this MRI, uh, we can see that muscle strain with that differential, that kind of, um, that kind of uh, lightening uh, in the T2 phase in the adductor compartments that represents an adductor strain. So tears of the muscle strains, again, rice is always the initial treatment, although it is somewhat hard to compress that area, but you can't get an ACE wrap up there if you're careful. Um, advance to uh, pain-free activities as your pain allows. But I would caution you uh, that if you let patients go too fast, they can re-injure these areas and they can develop this kind of chronic re-injury pattern. And so if someone's going to feel better, uh, their pain's going to improve before they're mechanically strong enough to go back to sports. So you kind of have to slow them down a little bit uh, before you let them go. But basically, once they're pain-free is a pretty clear indication that they're they're getting back to that point where they can go back to sports. Once this is accomplished, begin that strengthening program. So again, you don't just say good luck. You kind of keep working with them through the uh, through the appropriate strengthening program to focus on the muscle groups that were just injured, and they have kind of a graduated return to sports. <clears throat> hip and thigh contusion, iliac crest contusions, those hip pointer synd uh, syndromes that causes deep bleeding and swelling. Proximal thigh contusions, direct blows. Uh, again, treatment is all going to be that uh, rice, uh, functional rehab, no assisted passive stretching until they're pain-free. Uh, it's really uncommon, but if they get these huge hematomas, they may require evacuation surgically of those uh, uh, hematomas. 
In high energy contusions, you got to watch for compartment syndrome. Again, very uncommon, but I have had to release gluteal compartment syndrome before, uh, but it's again, very uncommon. <clears throat> again, remember compartment syndrome is really diagnosed with pain, paresthesias, pulselessness, paler, and pain with passive stretch. And so uh, in that particular area, in the buttock muscles, you're not really going to have compromise with the vasculature. So that's kind of hard to differentiate. But if their muscle is really hard, if they're really sensitive, if you stretch them and their pain is out of control, uh, at that point, we would striker, striker the uh, needle their uh, posterior gluteal compartment. And if it's super high, uh, at that point, we would uh, do a, a compartmental release of the gluteal muscles. Again, pretty uncommon, but something you just always have to think about. Heterotopic ossification, this is actually uncommon, but it does happen. Uh, and so typically if someone has a direct thigh contusion, so football players, they wear all these pads, but if they get hit just right by someone's knee or, or cleat or something like that, they can develop uh, potentially um, heterotopic ossification because of that hematoma uh, that occurs in the mid thigh. Uh, you can't just go in and excise these acutely. You have to wait about six or 12 months for that heterotopic ossification to uh, mature, and at that point, you could go in and surgically remove it. But if someone develops heterotopic ossification at that point, it's non-operative management until uh, that HO matures. Basically, you want to make sure the joints aren't getting stiff and so on. So move the joint, move the hip, move the knee, move the muscles as much as they can. Just let the heterotopic ossification go through its evolutionary steps. And then once it's mature, then we cut it out. <clears throat> Avulsion and apophyseal type injuries seen in the immature patient uh, can occur at the site of every major muscle attachment, uh, may need comparison views. That's what we were talking about earlier. So basically, if someone comes in with a right sided hip pain and they're 12 years old, uh, you may not be able to see a lot. Um, and so you want to get the non-injured non hip as well, that left hip, on a comparison x-ray to see if there are any changes. Uh, you may only see some periosteal reaction. Uh, surrounding the fascial layers. Um, and if it's displaced greater than two centimeters, it may need ORIF. But again, in the pediatric patient population, it's pretty uncommon that these kids are going to need surgery for this. Um, most of them are going to be managed non-operatively. Specific avulsion areas, again, that's sartorius off of the ASIS. Uh, remember, the sartorius muscle basically starts up around the ASIS, goes around the kind of the anterior, uh, approximately it's anterior, and then it kind of wraps around to the medial side of the, of the knee joint and then inserts with the pes anterior tendons. <clears throat> and so that can be injured. Um, the direct head of the rectus femoris off the AIIS, um, the adductor magnus uh, from the adductor tubercle, such as the splits, uh, can occur in cheerleaders. That sounds incredibly painful, uh, but it happens in that group. Uh, that's why I don't cheerlead, I'm just kidding. But iliopsoas from the lesser trochanter, rigorous hip flexion, uh, such as kicking uh, soccer players or, you know, uh, punters, those kind of uh, athletes can get those. Hamstrings from ischial tuberosities or the hurdler's fracture that happens with hip flexion and knee extension uh, that can cause, you know, hamstring apophysitis or apophyseal avulsions off the ischium and that sometimes needs surgery. But again, in this group, very uncommon. Um, again, uh, we just basically talked about all that, but that's kind of where the, if you look at this picture, that's where those uh, structures are. Uh, basically, A is the A, A, I, A, A, S, I, S, uh, C. I'm sorry, correction. A is the iliac crest. B is the A, S, I, S. C is the A, I, I, S. Uh, D is that uh, lesser trochanter, and E is the uh, ischium. So that's what those represent. <clears throat> Hip dislocations, again, you're not going to really miss this. Someone's going to come in and say, you know, they got tackled playing football and they dislocated their hip. That's going to be a pretty acute problem that you're all going to know happened pretty emergently. Um, you basically want to get that patient to the uh, some situation where they can get that hip reduced. Typically, they require sedation in the ER uh, or and maybe even the operating room to get that hip reduced. Once you get that thing reduced, you then want to get an X-ray maybe an MRI or CT scan even to better see if they have any incarcerated fragments within the hip joint. If that's the case, they do require surgery. Um, but sometimes uh, we see this from, uh, you know, periodically with skiing accidents or football players. And it's uh, most of the time they have a uh, non-fractured or basically simple dislocations that with it. that's without any fracture patterns. Um, if they have a complex fracture pattern, uh, 
uh, sorry, complex dislocation that represents there were fractures that may be incarcerated within the hip joint. Uh, most common complication is avascular necrosis. When this occurs, that happens in 10 to 20% of kids, uh, and that's devastating when it happens. Uh, it usually requires multiple surgeries and eventually ends up in a hip replacement. Uh, repeat MRI in three months. So basically, someone dislocates their hip, <clears throat> you're going to uh, reduce the hip, you're going to get an MRI or a CT scan or something like that to, again, look for any kind of incarcerated fragments, labral tears, those kind of things. And then three months later, you're going to repeat that MRI to see if they're developing any issues with their blood supply or avascular necrosis. Uh, it could even occur with a hip subluxation, uh, but definitely is a higher risk in a dislocation event. I took care of a kid like my second year in practice here. He was a uh, skier for Ski Club Vail. Uh, at the beginning of the season, he dislocated his, uh, I can't remember, right hip. And uh, obviously, we held him out for um, like six months, basically. No avascular necrosis. Um, and then the next season, he dislocated his other hip, um, doing the same thing. So I think the kid had some mild hip dysplasia. And so I think we sent him to Mark Philippon for uh, treatment of that. But it was just one of those situations where some people just have bad luck. <clears throat> uh, hip subluxations, those occur when you fall on a flex knee with hip adducted and with spontaneous reduction, may have a posterior wall fracture fragment. So again, just got to be careful once you reduce them. You want to really make sure you look at the joint with some kind of advanced imaging. Typically for fractures, we're looking with a CT scan. For soft tissue, we're looking with uh, an MRI. Uh, Non-weight bearing for six weeks, but we're turned to sports in about six to 12 weeks if MRI is negative and pain-free range of motion. <clears throat> Hip subluxation, MRI will show bone bruising of the femoral head, just like the ACL tears. You're going to see that kind of coup, contra coup type injury pattern, basically where the acetabulum and maybe the femoral head are bruised. Uh, typically, they are not dangerous, meaning that they typically will heal, but that's why we protect them for six weeks with uh, uh, crutches and so on, repeat MRIs. If they do have an osteochondral fracture fragment, that would oftentimes require surgical stabilization, or if they have a labral tear because of it, again, that likely would require um, a surgery for that. <clears throat> but again, we always start with non-operative care and just kind of see how the patients do. So non-operative care is, is the uh, first line of treatment for almost every injury pattern. Uh, that you see athletically. <clears throat> Little mention of labral tears in the early literature of orthopedics. Really didn't see this develop until the 1990s. Uh, a lot of that research was done here at the Stedman Clinic. Um, and we can see uh, basically see that through multiple etiologies. It's kind of a byproduct of uh, uh, diverse etiologies, both traumatic and developmental. Um, and typically, the mechanism is uh, for an acute tear is a sudden twisting or pivoting injury, often during athletic activity. Uh, patients with hip dysplasia, so subtle hip dysplasia, rely on their soft tissue strength for hip stability. So if you have a shallower socket, you may have a bigger labrum, in which case that labrum is required to prevent your hip from dislocating. So it doesn't take a lot for that to kind of get beat up over time. Consequentially, the other way, such as a CAM lesion or FAI, where you have too much coverage, can lead to this uh, same event. So too little coverage can cause labral tears. Too much coverage can cause labral tears. So um, unfortunately, uh, it's, you have to, it, you know, it happens really almost for any reason to anyone, no matter what your hip uh, anatomy looks like. So usually it happens in a younger patient without specific trauma. Again, this is more for those dysplastic patients uh, or FAI patients. Someone who has a healthy hip joint and develops a, uh, a labral tear has some kind of history of trauma. Uh, but for people who have uh, FAI, femoral tabular impingement or hip dysplasia, typically can develop it with trauma or without trauma. So that insidious onset. Hip uh, and groin pain with catching and clicking. The anterior labrum, again, you're going to check with flexion, abduction, extra rotation. That's the impingement test. Um, posterior labrum, you can check by passively flexing and internal rotation with passive loading. Some people have those labrums in the posterior aspect of the hip, again, with those hip subluxations. But most of them are going to be localized in the anterior uh, aspect of the hip just because of the nature of how you're positioned while you're playing sports, such as hockey or football linemen or something like ski racers. You're kind of more in that kind of crouched position. Uh, kind of that ready stance, ready position stance. Uh, 
<clears throat> so imaging, MRIs, uh, historically we used to get the arthrograms, um, but we've found that with our advanced imaging MRIs, we really don't need to get arthrograms as much anymore. Um, and I think arthrograms probably overdiagnose labral tears. And so now we just get an MRI. Um, so that's also uh, a nice thing because patients really don't like those arthrograms. They can be pretty uncomfortable. So again, femoral tablet impingement, we kind of talked about hip dysplasia where the socket is too shallow. And again, that's a very mild hip dysplasia, by the way, goes from mild, which is more like the ballet dancers who are really flexible to someone whose hip is dislocated. We use the crow classification uh, grade zero, which is normal hip one, which is a mild, mild dysplasia all the way to four grade four, where the hip is totally dislocated that you see in uh, someone with uh, developmental hip dysplasia or, you know, cerebral palsy or something like that. Um, that's a bad deal. So, but most of the patients we're going to see up here are going to have either FAI, which is what I have personally, where you have too much coverage with a pincer or a cam lesion. Pincers on the ass tablum and the cam is on the femoral neck or hip dysplasia, mild uh, uh, grade one hip dysplasia where the hip is just a little bit on the shallow side. And so with that being said, <clears throat> this is what FAI is. FAI, uh, a pincer lesion is where you have too much coverage anteriorly. And so basically what we're looking for is that kind of crossover figure of eight sign on x-rays. Basically where, where the anterior wall and the posterior wall kind of cross like this. On x-ray, that could be an indication that they have a labral tear if you see that crossover sign. Um, and that would indicate a pincer type lesion. A cam lesion is really more where they develop that kind of anterior femoral head neck kind of uh, osteophyte or bump. And that's what we're looking at here on these x-rays. So if you look in the bottom aspect of the screen, you have an overhanging rim, that's a pincer lesion. And if you look closely, it's very hard to see. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap between that uh, anterior and posterior wall. And that's why the lines of laternelle are so important to understand when you're looking at these x-rays. But again, you kind of have to cross your eyes and move it in and out of focus to see those things. Uh, but once you look at a lot of these, you start seeing those pretty quickly. Um, you might see an aspherical uh, ball. Uh, so basically, the femoral head should look like a golf ball on a golf tee. Um, and if you look at this one closely in the bottom left corner of the screen, there's a subtle uh, cam lesion there. Um, so it's more of like that egg-shaped look versus a golf ball. If you look at these other x-rays, you can see, you can see uh, really uh, in the middle aspect, that's a, that's a true cam. That's an obvious cam. Basically, the cam bump is bigger in diameter uh, than the actual uh, femoral head itself. That's a big, that's a problem. If you look at the bottom right corner of the screen, that's what that crossover sign looks like. And when you see that kind of crossover, the white line and the black line, that's basically that crossover between the anterior and posterior walls that represents that pincer type lesion. Though all those things can indicate that this patient with their physical exam and history may have a labral tear. <clears throat> Again, we don't have to get arthrograms as much, but when we were doing them, they had 90% sensitivity and 91% accuracy. Um, MRI alone results are variable, um, but again, with our newer 3T MRIs, and some people say those are too sensitive actually, but with our newer MRIs, we can see MRI, uh, labral tears more accurately without the arthrogram. So we're getting arthrograms less commonly than we did even five to 10 years ago. <clears throat> so kind of, this is what a labrum looks like. Um, basically, it looks like a thick cartilaginous structure, and it basically anchors onto the rim of the acetabulum, specifically in that chondral labral junction between the acetabular cartilage and the labrum uh, through those bony attachments there. And that's basically where it tears off, and that can cause a lot of pain, clicking, snapping, and function, uh, and sound like someone who has a meniscal tear in the knee. Uh, they might feel that mechanical sensation in their hip. <clears throat> so again, this is kind of a cross-sectional area of a labral tear. Uh, the section one that represents kind of, or I guess D on this image, that represents bone, okay? Uh, image three or A, that represents the labrum. Image two is the cross section or number two is a cross sectional area. Uh, and that chondrolabral junction is basically at C where the labrum and the cartilage, which is uh, the difference between uh, C and uh, like I said, B uh, represents that common area for tearing. And that can be where they develop issues. And once they tear at that spot, what we often see is it's not the labrum that uh, the labrum itself can cause some mechanical symptoms, but what happens is the cartilage uh, 
can develop a delamination effect where the joint fluid can kind of get into that uh, uh, that kind of interface between the bone and the cartilage, and it can kind of cause delamination. And once that starts to happen, it's a bad deal, and it's hard to salvage that hip at that time. <clears throat> so treatment, again, with labral tears, you're going to do maybe a local injection. Um, you know, those kind of diagnostic injections can be helpful if the diagnosis is somewhat still unclear. Uh, partial weight bearing, so if someone comes in with an acute labral tear, Oftentimes, you're going to try to treat them non-operatively again, try to rest them. If their symptoms go away, they can avoid surgery, actually. People do live with uh, labral tears as long as they're asymptomatic. But if they continue to be symptomatic, uh, you can go in and surgically repair these labral tears um, and so on. So that's kind of where labral tear treatments are. Again, uh, arthroscopic portals, basically, if you're not doing these surgeries, don't worry about it. But anytime you put a portal in around the hip joint, you got kind of danger zones around those portal sites and that's for you know the surgeon to know um, but basically anteriorly you got the femoral neurovascular bundle posteriorly you have the sciatic nerve and so you just got to make sure you don't hit those areas <clears throat> again kind of a cross-sectional area of the hip and as you can see anteriorly you have the uh, the femoral vessels that's kind of in the based on this cross-sectional area the femoral vessel, vessel femoral vessels are at the bottom so if you're doing those kind of uh, dollar portals uh, or anterior portals, excuse me, you got to be careful about that. If you're going posteriorly to fix something in the back, you got to be careful of the sciatic nerve. So just be careful uh, with those portal sites. Arthroscopically, this is what it looks like. The labrum is that kind of thickened white area. The acetabular cartilage is, is on the left side. The femoral head is here. And basically, as you go in, with your elevator, <clears throat> arthroscopic elevator, you can basically tease off that labral tear uh, between the chondrolabral junction, and that's how you can identify intraoperatively if they have a labral tear. So again, so that's labral tears. Hip fractures, thank goodness they're rare, but they can happen in our skiing patients. Oftentimes, these do require surgical fixation. Again, anytime someone has a, uh, a history of hip pain, you got to take a, a thorough history, a thorough physical exam, Keep in mind whether it was an acute or insidious onset. Um, athletic pubalgia is kind of a slow insidious onset type of diagnosis that can occur as an attenuation or tearing of the abdominal musculature insertion, uh, the transals, trans, transversalis fascia and the conjoined tendon and the internal and external obliques. Those can cause pain specifically as they attach to the pubic symphysis. Um, entrapment of the genital branch of the genital femoral uh, nerve or the iliolingual nerve. Uh, again, that can cause that kind of athletic uh, hernia, sports hernia. Uh, that can be very uncomfortable as well. Groin pain, athletic pubalgia. Again, those are those sports hernias, repetitive twisting type injuries, more common in hockey players, soccer, tennis. <clears throat> Basically, in 1999, 20 players on the injury roster for the NHL had groin pain that were diagnosed with sports hernias. So they are real. Uh, but good news is, uh, they typically get better with some physical therapy. Occasionally, surgically, the general surgeons will go in and release the, the areas that cause those nerves to be impinged or uh, kind of uh, incarcerated. And so that's sometimes why surgery is done for these. This is different than a true hernia where like the guts, the bowels, the omentum squeeze through the abdominal wall or through the uh, inguinal ring. And so that's a different thing. Sports hernias are really more of kind of a muscular strain. And occasionally, if the nerves are entrapped, uh, that's, uh, that's just uh, what's being irritated is the nerve itself. Um, so <clears throat> oftentimes, these can be uh, kind of end, end of season type injuries, um, but uh, they can be treated during the off season. People can get back in the, into the next season as long as they heal up. Uh, again, just kind of have to rule out some other stuff, but always get an x-ray. Uh, first line of defense, physical exam, 22% have tenderness over the conjoined tendon, insertional pubic tubercle, mid inguinal region. 88% of patients have pain with resistant hip adduction, uh, pain with sit-ups. Uh, those kind of things can indicate that they probably have a sports-related hernia. Again, management always non-operative first and occasionally have to do an operative uh, hernia or fee, uh, but they have really good outcomes if they do require uh, surgery. Uh, or I guess with or without surgery, they have good outcomes. So 44% um, <clears throat> do develop bilateral type pain. You got to be careful about that. Osteitis pubis. Again, this is an injury or tension of the adductor, the, the big inner thigh muscles. 
uh, and, or the abdominal muscles uh, at the level of the pubis. Uh, this occurs in the kicking type sports, running, jumping, and twisting type sports. Uh, may have clicking with range of motion, but this is inconsistent. Uh, osteitis pubis, uh, x-rays may show resorption or sclerosis. Treatment, rest, uh, NSAIDs, uh, typically first line always. Uh, moist heat, uh, the word moist is gross, but typically some kind of heat is important. Uh, corticosteroid injections, occasionally adductor uh, tenotomies are important, but again, pretty rare. And if you look at this x-ray in the uh, screen, the arrows are pointing to the pubic symphysis. You may see some sclerosis, some irritation of that area uh, that uh, uh, represents that osteitis pubis. It does typically get better, but occasionally does need some injections or something like that. Uh, bursitis, we see this every day. Uh, patients come with pain over the greater trochanter. Most commonly, women are at risk, but men get it too. Typically, if you have a wider pelvis or if you're running and you kind of, again, cross over midline as you run and step, that can cause pain over the greater trochanters. There's basically three reasons why people get bursitis. Greater trochanteric bursitis, I should say. One is a hip joint problem. That's why we always get x-rays. Um, uh, two is an overuse type injury, like running, for instance. And three is a back problem. And so if I see someone who has greater trochanteric bursitis, I get hip x-rays, I get back x-rays, I treat their bursitis. If their joint is healthy, their hip joint's healthy, I actually will have them go see a spine doc um, just to make sure we're not missing lumbar spine pathology. Uh, again, women might be more uh, predisposed to greater trochanteric bursitis because women typically have a wider pelvis. Uh, and that puts more strain on the greater trochanter because their knees are typically in a little bit more valgus alignment um, so that their legs look straight. But what's happening, their knees are a little bit more valgus, and that puts more strain on the greater trochanters. Um, and so the treatment with that, typically rest, stretching, NSAID, steroid injections, and occasionally surgery uh, for IT band lengthening or excision of the bursa. I typically tell people don't do those surgeries. Uh, because basically you're, you're kind of taking away one problem and potentially giving them something else like scar tissue issues, adhesions, that can be painful as well. So typically I tell people avoid surgery at all costs. If they feel surgery or if I feel surgery is their next step, I send it to someone who does a, whole lot, who does a lot of those, like a, like a sports-related hip specialist. I don't do those anymore. I did initially when I started. I just found them to be very dissatisfying for the patient and for me too. <clears throat> Snapping hip syndrome type 1, this is basically where the IT band is snapping over the greater trochanter. Uh, treatment is conservative. Uh, surgery, again, is also rarely indicated, but occasionally is uh, excision of the IT band, uh, Z-plasties. Uh, sometimes you have to stabilize the IT band to the greater trochanter um, if it doesn't calm down with some non-operative care. Uh, snapping hip syndrome type 2, this is really a snapping iliopsoas tendon. That's with that Thomas uh, Thompson test that we were talking about earlier. Um, and that can be uh, uh, treated non-operatively, uh, you know, majority of the time. Stress fractures, excuse me. Typically, we see these in endurance athletes or military recruits, people who go from a sedentary lifestyle all of a sudden thinking they want to run the Boston Marathon. They're going to be putting themselves at a higher risk for stress fractures. Uh, women runners are probably the highest group uh, that's at risk for this, specifically if they have the, uh, 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 the terrible uh, triad of eating disorders, amenorrhea, they get these stress fractures. And so typically if they're on the tension side, so kind of on the superior side of the femoral neck, they require surgical stabilization. If they're on the compression side, the inferior side of the uh, femoral neck, oftentimes you can treat those uh, non-operatively. And so if you look at the arrows in that top right corner of the screen, uh, the arrow that points down, that's the tension side, basically the side that the weight of the body wants to make worse. Uh, the compression side is on the inferior side of the femoral neck. That's the arrow that's pointing kind of up or to the right, so to speak. That represents that the bones, as the body walks, the weight actually will compress that. And actually compression is what helps uh, fractures heal. And so if you just kind of slow them down on crutches for six weeks, oftentimes those will get better without surgery. Stress fractures, again, about 1% to 18 percent uh, incidence, depending on what you read, uh, most often caused by increased training regimens. We'll have increased pain with axial loading of the extremity. Oftentimes x-rays are, are inconclusive and you have to get an MRI or even a bone scan to confirm the diagnosis. Tension signs require fracture or surgery. That's what we just talked about. Uh, displacement can be catastrophic in these athletic patients. 
Um, again, on the compression side, uh, typically non-weight bearing, no jogging for four to six weeks, basically until pain-free. Um, so exercise and osteoarthritis, no good studies stating that vigorous exercises causes early osteoarthritis. Some people you know, will say that uh, the harder you exercise, the more likely your joints are going to wear out. There's actually not a lot of science to support that. Uh, but typically, I tell patients we have two options in life. One is sit on the couch and get diabetes. The other one is exercise and get arthritis. That's kind of like more of a joke than anything. Um, but that is kind of globally what we see as well. Uh, ex excessive loading with an underlying injury is generally believed to accelerate OA. So if someone does have an injured joint like a labral tear or a meniscal tear, and they're still exercising vigorously on that, that can lead to early arthritis. But someone whose joint's in good health, it probably isn't going to cause, exercise probably isn't going to cause that healthy joint to break down just by itself. Something else has to happen. Uh, canine studies with long-term exercise did not show any increased sign in degenerative joint disease. Elite athletes show more osteoarthritis than controls, however, so you just kind of have to, you know, kind of caution people that the harder you pound on a joint, the faster it could fail. The science is inconclusive, so I tell my runners to get into biking or swimming, but, you know, runners, everyone likes to run, and you can't really sit them down or slow them down. You just kind of have to let them live their lives. Other sources of groin pain, don't forget the lumbar spine always causes pain to the groin. That's why you ask them to point with one finger where they hurt the most. Uh, pupe, uh, pudendal neuropathy, this happens in cyclists. This is more of numbness in the private parts in the uh, groin area. Uh, compression of the dorsal branch of the pudendal nerve between the pubis symphysis and the seat. Uh, that can cause your, your, your kind of the perineum to go numb. Uh, specifically, if you sit on a bike for too long, like a hard bike seat for too long, treatment basically change, change your bike seat or tilt of the seat can sometimes make that better. Obturator nerve entrapment, this occurs in skaters. Uh, basically, treatment is conservative. Uh, Oralgia parasthetica, this is a compression of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve uh, with anterior hip replacement. Sometimes that nerve can get injured and people can develop numbness around the anterior lateral thigh. Well, guess what? That same thing can happen if someone wears belts that are too tight or has blunt trauma to the side of their hip um, and they can have a positive Tunnel sign. Basically, you have to remove the underlying cause. So if belts are too tight or pants are too low, you just kind of have to tell people, hey, man, you, your fashion statement's like totally 1990s. You got to kind of catch up here. Um, so those things can cause some neuralgia uh, around the side of the hip. Um, but it's less common today because we're not seeing those kind of uh, <laughs> uh, fashion statements anymore. Compression of the sciatic nerve. Remember, the piriformis uh, sits uh, directly anterior to the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve typically runs deep to the piriformis. So piriformis syndrome can cause compression of the sciatic nerve. People with sciatic nerve typically, uh, sciatic nerve, sciatica, excuse me, typically have pain rating down all the way to their toes. And we oftentimes think it's a back problem, but actually just like carpal tunnel syndrome, you can get compressive neuropathies around the sciatic nerve and the piriformis uh, tightness is one reason that can occur. Um, and treatment typically is conservative, maybe some injections, physical therapy, and maybe occasionally a piriformis release. Um, but uh, hamstring muscle syndrome as well, that can cause some irritation of the, of the sciatic nerve. So those posterior, so posterior muscles in the po posterior hip can cause some sciatic nerve compression, but most commonly sciatica is a real issue with the uh, lumbar spine. So overview, just kind of wrapping up, we talked about uh, hip pain in the athletes, epidemiology. Uh, we talked about anatomy of the hip, kind of the muscular uh, soft tissues, as well as the bony anatomy, as well as some of the x-ray findings that we see uh, with the six lines of late turnel, uh, differential diagnosis, acute onset versus insidious onset. Those things kind of help you understand if it's uh, you know, kind of what what potentially is going on. Some of the history and physical exam maneuvers that we, you know, d that we perform during our clinic visit with the patient uh, and some of the treatment options we have. Good news is a lot of this is going to be initially treated non-operatively with physical therapy, the RICE acronym, and kind of a slow reintroduction to athletics as pain allows. And those handful of patients that just don't get better eventually do get surgery, uh, but that's actually not as common.